Welcome to the next lecture in the series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to talk about spin orbit coupling and how spin orbit coupling lifts the degeneracy of the atomic terms that we have found due to Coulomb interaction. When you think of spin orbit coupling, then this is a relativistic effect, and the Hamiltonian you can derive or we derived from the Dirac equation is given by a one electron operator summing over all electrons and then a coupling constant that depends both on the principal quantum number n and l and then the angular momenta inner product with the spin of the electron. Now what we have seen in the previous video that the atomic terms with spin orbit coupling with uh, Coulomb interaction can be written as states where labeled by total angular momentum, total spin momentum, and the projection of the angular momenta on the z-axis. For this we derived operators, summing over all electrons, where the total angular momenta is given by the angular momenta of each electron separately summed over all electrons. Now if we look at the commutator between the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian and for example the z component of the angular momenta then we find that is proportional to the coupling constant times sum over all electrons i h bar minus l y s x plus l x s y which is non-zero so the moment we have spin orbit coupling, L is no longer a conserved quantum number. And the same is true for the spin. And we find that here the commutator I h bar and then L y s x minus L x s y. And also that is non-zero. So the labeling we had of our states by L, Lz, S and Sz is no longer an eigenstate. Of the Coulomb operator plus the spin orbit coupling operator. So in principle, we should find a completely new set of states and ways to label them. Now we can look at the commutator of the spin orbit coupling operator with the total angular momenta. And the total angular momenta is given by L plus S. And as we already see here, that that's some um, is zero. Um, we also know that the Coulomb operator commutes with J, it commutes with L and S, so it definitely commutes with the sum of L and S, such that we still can label our eigenstates by beta, some quantum number labeling states with the same total angular momenta and the projection of the total angular momenta on the z-direction. Um, of course, there are not as many states here as we had there, such that there will be many different terms with the same beta. Um, now, the good thing is that our Coulomb interaction is generally larger than the spin-orbit energy, such that our quantum number beta roughly labels the states that we had before for the Coulomb interaction, such that spin orbit coupling splits the same states within a Coulomb term, but doesn't mix between different terms. Well, this is not completely exact. There definitely is a mixing between Coulomb terms, but in the first approximation, we could neglect it and just treat the different terms separately. Um, actually, if you 
do the calculations in a computer, then this is really a beautiful single electron operator that is easy to include on the full level, such that it's not so difficult to include the interaction between the Coulomb terms. Um, but it is nice to look at what happens in a single Coulomb term, first of all, because it gives you analytical understanding. And secondly, the techniques that we use here on an atom by finding effective operators acting in a low energy Hilbert space um, are techniques that you can use for many body problems where um, just using computers to numerically solve the problem is not so easy or way too hard for a computer to handle. So we find that um, within an atomic term, the spin orbit coupling uh, roughly lifts the degeneracy according to J and JZ, um, but on zeroth order doesn't mix the different atomic terms such that we can label our states still by alpha, L and S, and then J and JZ. Now, we should ask ourselves, is this a unique label to label all states within an atomic term? And in order to answer that question, we can do counting and see if we have as many independent states in an LS term as we have that we can label with an LS -J -J Z state. Now, we know that the Z component of the total angular momenta is in between minus J and plus J. Then we also know that the total angular momenta that we can make by coupling L and S goes from L minus S up to L plus S. They can either be perpendicular to each other, in which case factor addition is the difference between the two, or you can have a parallel in which the total length is the sum of the length of each of them. Now we can have a look at the multiplicity of an LS term. And we know that the number of states is 2L plus 1 for the multiplicity due to the angular momenta times 2S plus 1 due to the multiplicity of the spin. Our states alpha, L, S, J, J, Z have a multiplicity that is given by a sum where J goes from L minus S up to L plus S and where J, Z goes to goes from minus J to J and we have one state for each of them. So this gives me the sum over J is L minus S up to L plus S to J plus 1 for the sum of 1 for minus J to J. And this we can write as 2 times the sum of J L minus S to L plus S of J plus the sum of J is L minus S to L plus S of 1. This is equal on the R 2J plus, uh, sorry, 2S plus 1 terms in there. So this is 2, 2S plus 1. And on average, the value of this sum is L. And on the other side, we just have 2S plus 1 terms in there. And the sum and totally is 2s plus 1 times 2l plus 1. And indeed, that is the same as the multiplicity of an LS term. So by labeling our states by alpha L as J, J, Z, we are able to label all states that we could have labeled by L, L, Z, S and S, Z. Or in other words, alpha L, L, Z, S, SZ and 
alpha L and yield yield Z can be used to span the same Hilbert space. Now we can define the raising and lowering operators jx plus minus ijy and our Hamiltonian commutes with j and therefore also commutes with the raising and lowering operators and acting with our raising or lowering operator on a state with an angular momenta and a projection of that angular momenta gives you and j plus minus jz plus 1, j minus plus jz times the state with the angular momenta raised or lowered. Such that we find that with spin orbit coupling we have 2j plus 1 degenerate states. within an alpha L S J term. And we can now write our germ symbols as 2S plus 1, J, the multiplicity, the angular momenta, and then we have a J, so 2S plus 1, L, and a sub-index J for the total angular momenta. We can now have a look at the energy of the other terms. And for this we can look at the matrix elements of our Hamiltonian between the eigenstates. that we were able to derive based on conservation of angular momenta. So in order to calculate this expectation value, we need our Hamiltonian on the basis of the eigenstates that we have, or on the basis of alpha, L, Lz, S and Sz, which is a matrix of dimension 2s plus 1, 2l plus 1. Of course, when we have the Hamiltonian on a jot jot z basis, you're already in the eigen basis, but if we have it on a basis on l, l, z, s, and s, z, the unitary transformation, just diagonalizing that matrix, will give you the eigenstates. Now the energy within an alpha Ls term only depends on J. Such that we know that we can write our spin orbit coupling operator within our Ls term as some function of the operator j. With this we can make a Taylor series expansion j to the power 0. Well, j to the power 1 is a vector, so that's not being allowed. And then we have a fourth order term, etc. And we also know that this has to be equal to the microscopic Hamiltonian within our basis, which is given by the alpha Ls term. So the question that we now want to answer are what are expansion coefficient Ci, because the moment I know what Ci are, I can easily calculate the expectation values of the operator j or powers of operator j on my basis and I know what my Hamiltonian is. So the task that we set ourselves to do is to expand our spin orbit coupling operator on powers of j. Well, 
for functions, this is something similar to a Taylor series expansion. Um, or for vectors, we know very well how to do this. For vectors, we can define a complete orthonormal set. Orthonormal set phi i, and then we can expand a state on this set of states and we know that this is then given by a sum over some coefficient times our state and this coefficient can be calculated with the use of an inner product. Now operators are not vectors but can be represented as matrices on a Hilbert space But also for operators, we can define an inner product and make a very similar expansion. So let A and B be matrices with elements A i j or B i j. And these are matrices representing operators on Hilbert space where we can define our vectors and inner products. Now we can define an inner product for our operators. And we define, with using the same notation as we do for our vectors, but now we do not sum over the elements of our vector, but we sum over all elements of our matrix, the complex conjugate times B i j. Now we define two matrices to be orthonormal and we can take operator a k and a k prime and a and k and a and k prime are defining an orthonormal set if for every k and k prime the inner product is delta k k prime. So we can make an example of an orthonormal set of operators. And for that we first of all define a Hilbert space. So we define the 2s plus 1 Lj term as our set of states, there are 2j plus 1 of them, and we can now define the operator jz, jz prime, given by ls, j, and now my pen is getting empty, ls, j, jz, d cat, and the l s j, jz. But, uh, and let's put an alpha in here for completeness. And this gives you an, an orthonormal set of operators. There are 2j plus 1 square of such operators. jz can be from minus j to j, and jz prime can go from minus j minus j to j and this as a matrix representation would be a matrix with all zeros except for the element jz jz prime which would be one so that is definitely an orthonormal set for your operators now if you want to expand an operator on an orthonormal set Then we can write an orthonormal and complete set 
of operators. Then our operator is given as a sum over all operators in our orthonormal set of operators. The inner product between the operator we are looking at and the operator on which we expand times the operator on which we expand. So now let's use this to expand the spin orbit coupling operator on powers of j. So we want to expand our spin orbit coupling operator within an ls j term on powers of j. n is 0, 2 infinite, some prefactor j dot j to the power n. Now the first thing we have to solve is that j to the power 2n is not orthogonal. And that's actually a general problem of Taylor series expansions. Um, you know how to do these kind of expansions by taking derivatives, but the functions x, x squared, x, x cubed, etc. are not orthonormal, and the same happens here. Our powers of j are not orthonormal. So as a first step, we have to orthonormalize the basis on which we expand. And the orthonormal set of operators that we will find have a name, and they are called the Stevens operators. Now Stevens orthogonalized but did not normalize his set of operators, which resulted in many different possible phases and normalizations for the Steven operators. Um, but let's here expand on an orthonormal set and also a normalized set. So for the case where n is equal to zero, we have to look at the zeroth power of an operator, and that yields the identity operator. Now, we have to still normalize the identity operator, because if we take the inner product of the identity operator with itself, then this is the sum over ij. Now the matrix representation of the identity operator has once on the diagonal, and we are looking at element ij, and then of course we have to square these elements, but 1 times 1 is just 1, such that this is equal to the dimension of your Hilbert space. So within an ls term, we have n is 2s plus 1, times 2L plus 1, such that within an LS term, the zeroth order normalized Stevens operator is given as 1 over square root 2S plus 1 times 2L plus 1 times the identity operator. So now we have found the zero ordered Stevens operator, and with that we can have a look at the next order where n is equal to 1, or the second order Stevens operator, which is proportional by j dot j, where we have to orthogonalize j dot j, or to normalize it with respect to the identity operator and normalize it. Now, we require that O2 in a product 1 is equal to 0. We can calculate the inner product of j squared with respect to the identity operator. And the identity operator is just a diagonal such that this, if you look at a matrix representation of your operator, is the trace of that matrix. Now, in order to represent our operator on a matrix, we are going to choose a basis. So within an alpha ls term, 
we can define a basis given by the states alpha, L, S, J, Jz. And we now look at the trace of the operator J dot J. And for that we sum over all states. J is L minus S up to L plus S. Sum Jz is minus J up to J. And we now have to look at the expectation value of j square for the diagonal, and that is given by j times j plus 1. This is, if we can just sum over jz, that gives you 2j plus 1, and the value that we sum doesn't depend on jz. And we still have this sum over j. Now we're gonna skip some algebra here, and what we're left with is a 2l plus 1, 2s plus 1, and then l times l plus 1 plus s times s plus 1. What we find in front here is the term multiplicity. And what we find here is the expectation value of L square and the expectation value of S square of all our states within the term. Such that we can say that the trace of J dot J minus L square minus S square is equal to zero. So once we found a traceless representation that is orthogonal, to the identity operator, we still have to find a normalized uh, version, so we have to calculate the norm. So j square minus l square minus s square is orthogonal to the identity operator within an LS term. Now we can calculate the norm. And this is given by the sum, which we had before. J is L minus S to L plus S. The sum Jz is minus J up to j, and then this is a diagonal operator, so we can just look at the diagonal elements. Which we don't have a double sum, but only a single sum. And there we find j times j plus 1 minus l times l plus 1 minus s times s plus 1 in total squared. Now again, we can do some algebra to simplify this sum, and what you find is 4 thirds L times L plus 1 S times S plus 1, and then 2 L plus 1 times 2 S plus 1. So our second Stevens operator normalized is given by the square root of 3 over 4 L, L plus 1, S, S plus 1, 2 L plus 1, 2 S plus 1, times J square minus L square minus S square. Now we can rewrite this operator slightly. We know that J square is L plus S square, and therefore this is equal to L square plus S square plus 2L dot S, such that our Stevens operator becomes equal to the square root of 3 over L 
times L plus 1, S times S plus 1, 2L plus 1, 2S plus 1, and then L dot S, where the 2 went to cancel the 4 under the square root. So within an LS term, we have that our operator where we sum over Le dot Se for all electrons is equal to some constant times O2 plus some constant uh, O0 times O2. Now Le dot Se is the angle between L and S. We are summing when we calculate um, the projection of L dot S dot O, summing over the trace of that operator because this is the identity operator, such that we know that the inner product of Le dot Se summed over E with O0 is going to be 0, because this is the average over all possible angles of all states between L and E, between L and S. And therefore we know that C0 is 0. We now define Lambda alpha Ls as C2 square root of 3 over 2s plus 1, 2l plus 1, l times l plus 1, s times s plus 1, such that we are left with the equation that our spin orbit operator is given by lambda alpha l s l dot s. Now we can calculate C2, of course, by taking the inner product of our spin orbit coupling operator with our Stevens operator. But let's have a look um, how we can actually determine this by just looking at our basis states. And if we have our coupling constant where the operator is capital L dot capital S, then we can express this coupling constant as a G factor times the coupling constant that we have as the microscopic interaction between the single electrons separately. So we can define an effective interaction acting on an effective Hamiltonian within our LS term that is given by a projection of the effective operator on the full operator within your effective Hilbert space. Now, this is of course a term dependent procedure and therefore we have a term dependent G factor. We can determine this G factor by looking at the states that we have in our term. If you can find a single slater determinant,
then for that single oscillator determinant, you know that alpha L, Lz, S, Sz is given by just a single product state, L for electron 1, Lz for electron 1, S for electron 1, Sz for electron 1, up to L for electron n, Lz for electron n, S for electron n, Sz for electron n. Where of course the spin is a half for electrons. And we now can easily calculate expectation values alpha L, Lz, S, Sz of lambda alpha Ls, L dot S, alpha L, Lz, S, Sz is equal to lambda alpha Ls, Lz, Sz. Note that these states do not have to be eigenstates of your Hamiltonian. The claim is that these two operators, where are they? This operator and sum over e, l e dot s e are exactly equivalent within the Hilbert space. So all matrix elements have to be equivalent. And on the same hand, we can calculate this matrix element for the other operator representation, sum over e, l e, s e. And that is equal to zeta and l sum over e lz e z e. Now of course this only works if you find a single slater determinant representation. And in this case, alpha l s is equal to 1 over l z s z sum over e. Lzi, Szi, Zeta, and L. And then what we find in front of here is your G factor. Once you have states that are not, or we have terms where none of the states is single slater determinant representable, and um, you'll have to sum over the possible set of determinants that you have here in order to calculate the expectation values. Now we have seen that um, the states that we have are split by energy by the group interaction into terms with L and S as a quantum number with spin-orbit coupling, they are split further into LSJ terms. And we still have a 2J plus 1 fold degeneracy of our states. This degeneracy is lifted when you turn on a magnetic field. And then the size of the splitting is what determines the local magnetic moment. So we have our terms given by 2s plus 1 L J term symbols. And this has a degeneracy where Jz can run from minus J up to J. So a 2J plus 1 fold degeneracy. If we turn on the magnetic field, this degeneracy is lifted, and this is the Zeeman effect. Now, historically, the Zeeman effect played an important role because it explained that um, electrons have a spin, um, that states um, can be seen as linear superpositions of each other um, in a magnetic field, an atomic absorption line splits into a discrete numbers of line and not in a continuum because well, you excite into states 
And although you can rotate your magnetic moment to any direction with respect to a magnetic field, um, the eigenstates you excite into with an atomic absorption are only given by some discrete set of states, uh, which also then comes back in the periodic table, where you have a doubling of the number of states, which what you would respect, expect um, just based on angular momenta. Now the Hamiltonian that we have for the interaction with the magnetic field is given by mu Bohr times the angular momenta of your electrons and then the g factor for the spin of an electron times the magnetic field. And we will take the g factor to be 2, which it is roughly. Now you can look at the commutator of the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian with a magnetic field, and then we see that this is non zero. So the different LSJ terms. mix when we turn on a magnetic field. Now for our notation let's assume that our magnetic field is parallel to the z-direction. We can do this without loss of generality because we haven't defined the direction so far. Our systems were spherical or rotational invariant. And then we'll find that jz does commute with our Hamiltonian, such that our eigenstates are now labeled by gamma and dot z. So we see that the more interactions we add, the less symmetry we have and the less um, quantum numbers that are left that are still good unique quantum numbers and the more all states get, in principle, the same label. Now, magnetic fields are small compared to spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling is small compared to Coulomb energy, such that instead of the quantum number gamma, we can, with a reasonable approximation, take the quantum numbers alpha, ls, and j. And that's what we will do here. Again, in a computer, there's no need to make all these approximations, but when you work with hand, that makes it definitely easier to understand what goes on. So we now can have a look at the effect of a magnetic field on basis states given by alpha, s, j, and jz. And the first effect that I want to discuss is the mixing of the different states with different j. And we will do this within perturbation theory, such that in first order perturbation theory, the energy changes, but the wave function doesn't, such that we can still label our states by alpha j as alpha l s j j z. So our states are the states alpha l s j j z. And I want to look at the change of energy of that state. due to a magnetic field. And we use perturbation theory, so we have the size of the magnetic field, and we took our magnetic field to be in the z-direction, b square because of the interaction strength, and then we have to sum, and we know that our Hamiltonian commutes with jz. I'm going to neglect the interaction of states with different LMS, and we just sum over states with different j that is not equal to j prime that is not equal to j and now we have our perturbative energy alpha ls j jz 
the interaction of tonium LZ plus 2 asset of LS J prime JZ squared divided by the energy difference of our states alpha LSJ JZ minus the energy alpha LSJ prime JZ. Uh, the prime should be here. And this the energy of uh, LSJ JZ there is given by the expectation value of the spin orbit coupling operator. which is lambda alpha ls l dot s. The magnetic moment induced due to the mixing of states with different j is the Van Vleck magnetic moment or the Van Vleck magnetism. If you want to calculate the magnetic moment, moment of a state, then the magnetic moment is given by the change of energy with respect to the applied magnetic field and the susceptibility is defined as the limit of the magnetic field to zero dm dh. Now when our temperature is much smaller than the spin orbit coupling interaction, you're only occupying the lowest set of states and therefore your susceptibility is temperature independent. So you will find that there is a constant contribution to your magnetic susceptibility as a function of temperature due to the mixing of your lowest LSJ term with the higher excited LSJ terms due to the magnetic field. Now, besides this magnetic moment that is generated because you have perturbative mixing in of excited states, we have the Curie magnetic moment and the Curie magnetic moment is related to the direct expectation value of the Hamiltonian for a magnetic field between these states that we have in an LSJJZ term or in an LSJ term and the differences between the different LZ states in there. Now, what we're going to do is this operator that interacts um, with a magnetic field, or describing the interaction of your electrons with a magnetic field, uh, we can expand in terms of J. That's giving you a complete set of operators, and for these operators, we can easily calculate the expectation value. So L plus 2S is going to be written as a sum with some prefactors and then a Taylor series in J. Now L plus 2S is equal to J plus S. And we know that different orders of J have different symmetry properties such that this is just G times alpha LSJ. And the only 
term that has allowed by symmetry is the one that has the same symmetry as j, and all other terms must be zero. Or in other words, within an LSJ, or within an LS term, we can write our spin operator as the Lande G factor, LSJ minus one, times the total angular momentum. So now we have to determine our g factor, and of course we can do this again by taking the inner product of your operators on the full basis. But we can also do this based on some physical arguments. And for that we can look at factor coupling of angular momenta. If we look at the operator J, then this describes an angular momentum. Now we can project this on an axis JZ, where we have a magnetic field. And our total angular momenta will process around this. And J rotates where you have to be a bit careful about this rotation because it's not that if you look in the x direction that you see a magnetic moment that is oscillating. This is a rotation in uh, configuration space, which are your quantum fluctuations. And we have to take a configuration average. Similar behavior happens when we look at the spin contributing to J, then our total spin rotates around J, such that when we have our total angular momenta, we can look at the spin. And then we find that this rotates around that spin such that the projection of S on J is given by S dot J. Now if you want to know the fraction that S contributes to J, then you find that this is J dot S divided by J dot J. Now in quantum mechanics we have to be a bit careful, we have to take expectation values of these operators such that within an LSJ term, we find that our operator S is given by the operator J, and then we take expectation values of an LSJ JZ, and it's not going to depend on JZ, J dot S, the projection of S on J alpha LSJ. Jz divided by the total length of J. Now, in order to evaluate J dot S, we can make a nice simplification. We write J dot S once as L plus S dot s and once as j times j minus l 
and this is equal to a half s dot s plus j dot j plus l dot s minus j dot l and j dot l is l dot l uh, plus s dot l and that will cancel the s dot l here such that we're left with a half s dot s plus j dot j minus l dot l with this we find that our g factor of uh, j is equal to 1 because the interaction is L plus 2s or j plus s plus the expectation value of s square is s times s plus 1 the expectation value of j square is j times j plus 1 minus L L plus 1 divided by 2 because we have a half here and then the length of j is j times j plus 1. That is the Landé g factor. So we will find that the Curie Hamiltonian is mu b times the g-factor of L as j, j dot h. Now, at low temperatures, we can with this also determine the magnetic moment, the Curie moment of your system is minus the dh, and the lowest, excited, the lowest state in your term as jz is equal to j, such that this is mu b times the g factor times j, because jz is equal to j. What I've shown you is that we can use these kind of projections of operators on other operators that are easier to calculate, um, just as you can project states on complete set of states, we projected operators on complete sets of operators, and with this we have an easy handle on approximate uh, expectation values in low energy sectors of your Hamiltonian. Um, in the end, with the computers that we have nowadays, um, I would always implement spin orbit coupling as a one electron operator instead of capital L with capital S and magnetic fields as one electron operators instead of operators acting on capital J. Um, but nonetheless, for understanding where your from vectors come from, where your Curie susceptibility comes from, what your G factors are. This is, of course, uh, a very powerful method to work with. Um, and it can be applied much more general than what we did here for magnetism. It's, of course, been developed in magnetism much earlier than for other kind of approximations that we can make. And it really nicely shows you how you can work with these kind of operator equivalents in different states or different systems. Thank you very much for your attention. We see you later. Stay healthy.